Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the New South Wales Family Daycare Association webinar in the PD in Your Pocket series. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us this evening. We're really excited to have everyone together for another session. Um, I can see that lots of people are coming in now. Um, my name is Elizabeth. Um, you may recognize me from previous PD in Your Pocket sessions. I will be your facilitator this evening. So before we begin, um, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which we meet today. Um, I know where, especially when we do webinars, we are on lots of different lands um, with many traditional owners, but New South Wales Family Daycare Association is presenting this webinar from Gadigal country. So it's important um, that we remember that Aboriginal elders and families have been planning uh, for the education of Aboriginal children on this land for thousands of years. Um, so we'd like to recognise them before we begin. Um, Something else I would like to uh, refresh your memory on, we sent you a special um, a link, especially for the prepared booklet last week. Um, if you didn't receive it, you can find the link on the screen here if you're watching this presentation. If you're listening to it as a podcast, the link is www.nswfdc.org.au forward slash PD in your pocket. So we have um, something else I want to clarify before we get started. We have been getting a lot of inquiries about certificates after each session. So just want to remind everyone um, that your certificates generally go out about a week after the webinar. So give it a little bit of time. Unfortunately, we can't send certificates to people that listen to the webinar as a podcast um, or watch it as a, as a recorded video after the session. Only people that watch it live um, will be getting Getting the certificate so just keep that in mind as well. Um, if you don't receive your certificate within a week you can email us at info at nswfdc.org.au but please note um, that the reason most people don't get their certificates is that they may have typed their uh, email in cor incorrectly um, or because it's gone to their junk mail so just check those issues before you do um, get in contact with us. Uh, also, a lot of people are joining us um, from interstate, so can I remind everyone that PD in Your Pocket is provided by New South Wales Family Daycare Association. Um, we ensure what we say is correct for New South Wales Family Daycare Services. Um, you may need to double check if you have any doubt about if things are slightly different in your state, um, but we do encourage you to look into that. Please remember um, to check out the web address for PD in Your Pocket that's on the screen because all the topics we ran last year and also this year to date um, still remain online. So if there were any that you missed, you're very welcome to go back and revisit those. And also the Facebook page, as always, that's still going really well. Um, and you can discuss different PD in Your Pocket topics um, on that Facebook page. It's a great way to network with everyone who participates in these sessions and share ideas. So if you haven't done so already, please join that um, our Facebook group and we'd love to uh, see some inspiration and ideas around your programming and planning this evening. Okay, so um, you may remember when you registered for tonight's session, um, we did ask you some questions and we'd like to share the results with you. I've got them here for you. Okay, so the first um, question that we asked was how far ahead do you plan or program or how far ahead do we uh, work out what we're going to do with the children that we care for? So these results were um, were much what we expected. 22% of us do it mostly on the day. 52% uh, of us do it the week before. 
12% do it a fortnight ahead and 14% plan um, for the month ahead. So just over half of us are programming for the week ahead. Now there's no legal requirement that tells us how far ahead we have to program and plan, um, but this gives, a, gives you a good idea of what everyone else is doing. So the next question we ask um, is if you create a written program. So the results were a bit scary because 64% of us didn't answer the question. Um, now, either there was a mistake in the data or somehow a lot of us um, that know that we're supposed to be doing a written program um, but didn't want to say um, and or that we don't actually do one. So the regulations require that you prepare a program um, that families can look at. They actually need to see what is happening. And of course you can do it on paper or um, print it out. It's really very open as to the method that you do it. Um, and we'll talk about some ideas around how you can do this later on. 20% uh, of you always do a written program, 15% mostly, and 1% rarely do. And then finally, we ask which of these things you use to prepare your program. So 38% of you um, use children's interests, so you're really guided by what the children are interested in. 5% uh, of us use family suggestions. A huge 30% of us said that they use special days and 25% said they use themes. Um, so the National Quality Standard requires that our programs be child-centered. Um, some of these methods such as themes and special days are very hard to do in a child-centered way because uh, they're quite structured and you're really coming in with a preconceived idea of what it is you're going to um, program around and what you're going to deliver. So sometimes they can um, contradict each other having those themes and days set out uh, but also trying to be led by the child's interest. So just bear that in mind as well. Okay, let's have a look at the overview of what we're covering tonight. Um, so lots of great content this evening. We're going to um, go through seven key areas. The first one being what terms um, such as programming and planning mean. So really looking at the definition of those. Uh, when and how we should plan, how to make our program and planning child-centred. Um, again, that's really what we want to focus on tonight. How do we follow um, the interests and needs of each child? Learning experiences, environments and resources for child-centred activities. Child-centred planning with different ages. Spontaneity, because that does um, play a really important part um, in planning. Um, although this is all about programming and planning, it's important to remember that we must embrace spontaneity and we must be, um, we must be open minded to things that we're not always prepared for, but learning opportunities arise all the time. Um, and a strong educator with strong practice will know how to embrace that. And then making planning visible. So making sure that anyone who does come into your service, into your family daycare, um, can be able to see exactly what it is that you're doing. Um, and not just what you're doing today, um, but what you're planning to do ahead of time. So that's a bit of an overview of what we'll be covering tonight. Okay, so the first step is let's have a look at um, defining our terms. And it's a good place to start so that when I do refer to particular terms, we're all on the same page and we know what to expect. So planning and programming is what you do as an educator to work out what you're going to do with the children um, while they're with you. So educators are asked to plan for children through a constant process of thinking about what experiences they are providing for children and why. Now the why is really important. Of working out um, experiences 
So when working out experiences, you need to um, have them set up for children to help them learn. And the next thing they need to learn. So not just what they're doing, but what they're going to do next. So what is the difference between planning and programming? So for the purpose of this topic, child-centered planning and programming, we'll definite, I will define the words like this. So let's say that planning um, is the process of designing experiences and activities aimed at developing and extending a child's thinking, skills, interests and abilities. So educators sometimes call this program, uh, this process programming, um, but for tonight we're going to call that the planning. And the program is a written version of the plan. So if we can think through this evening, keeping those two terms um, and those definitions, uh, then we can make sure that we're nice and clear. So it's always important to go back to what the regulations um, ask of us in terms of compliance and our practice, what they're demanding us to do. So Regulation 73 demands that we offer an educational program that contributes to the following outcomes for each child. And these are on the slide for you now. The child will have a strong sense of identity, the child will be connected with and contribute to um, his or her own world. The child will have a strong sense of well-being. The child will be confident and an involved learner. And the child will be an effective communicator. So you may recognise those five points um, as the outcome from the uh, the outcomes from the learning frameworks. So the regulation is requiring that as educators we offer an educational program to children that help them meet the learning frameworks. Um, so they're very closely linked to each other. Now, Regulation uh, 75 and 76 um, also ask of us that information about the content and operation of the educational program is displayed at a place accessible to parents. So keep that in mind. Parents need to be able to see it. And that information about the content and operation of the educational program and the child's participation in the program be given to a parent on request. So at any point in time, any of um, the parents at your, at your family daycare can ask um, to see that educational program and how, and also ask for details about how their child is participating in it as an individual. So not just how the whole group of children are participating, but how their child is participating in the program. So you must be able to show the program you have prepared for parents. That's the key point. Okay, so the other thing we want to discuss is that um, the National Quality Standard, um, which is law because it is actually part of the regulations. So when you think about anything in the National Quality Standard, make sure you do think of it as compliance, um, requires that our program and practice be child-centred so that each child's current knowledge, strengths, ideas, culture, abilities and interests are the foundation of the program. So what are the regulations demanding of us overall? They demand that as a family daycare um, educator, we um, offer an educational program that helps a child meet the outcomes, um, make that program available to parents, and that the program needs to be child-centered. So it's a legal requirement that your program as a family daycare educator be child-centered because of those three points. It helps the child meet their outcomes, it's available to parents, um, and that it is child-centered. So another really important point to keep in mind.
So now that that's really clear to us, let's get an understanding of what does child-centered mean. Now the slide you're looking at is a word cloud from um, out of the words in the EYLF, the Early Years Learning Framework. Now word clouds count the number of times that a word appears in a document and form a cloud of the most common words with the most common use bigger. So the word that's used the most is the biggest. Um, and this is, these are all the words um, that you commonly see in the EYLF. So note that the word children is the most common word. So it is the largest and it's in the center. Uh, this is like a metaphor for child-centered learning. So children are the most important thing so that they must be at the center of our program. Now we know that children learn best when they make connections between the diverse prior experiences and their learning in early education and care. So what they've learned before and what they're now learning with you in your family daycare environment. Um, they learn best when they participate in making decisions. So giving children choice and allowing them to participate when you are doing anything from setting up or planning an activity, the child should have choice and, and be allowed to make decisions. Um, making choice and contributing to learning experiences sharing their opinions and diverse experiences. So every child has got a history and they're coming to you um, with previous experiences. So it's important that you embrace that and include that in your planning. Um, discuss their learning. So let them talk about what they're learning. They, they, most of the time children love to tell you exactly what it is that they're doing, um, especially if they've done something for the first time. That's a perfect example of allowing a child to discuss their learning. Um, learn in a responsive and supportive social environment, so being connected with the educator, but also being social with the other children in care. Um, learn through multi-sensory experiences, so using more than one of their sense, um, senses. Participate actively in experiences and engage them emotionally, physically, cognitively and socially. So making sure that you're engaging them in all those different ways. Now, as we just learned um, in element, uh, element 1.1.2 of the NQS, a child-centered program is um, where each child's current knowledge, strengths, ideas, culture, abilities, and interests are the foundation of the program. So, how does play fit in to all of this. We know the absolute importance of play. Um, play provides children with the following opportunities and I've got a list here, I'll go through them. And as I go through them, just have a think about, um, you know, how you can relate to this in anything that you're doing in your practice or at your service um, or the children in your care. So have a think. Um, play provides children with the opportunity to practice physical skills. So do your children on a daily basis have opportunity to practice physical skills? Release energy, very important. I was home with my toddler all day today and I know the importance of releasing energy. Um, develop positive social skills and behavior. So is there opportunity for them to engage with each other? Do you have resources that allow for the opportunity for them to share and take turns? Learn about themselves and others. So understanding that it's not just them, there are others out there and how to engage with them. Build self-esteem and be confident. Learn and practice language, very important. Um, and that can only happen when they have opportunity to have conversations and engage with others. Um, develop creativity, imagination and curiosity, one of the great points of play. Pursue and develop their own interests. Uh, explore materials and equipment and natural objects and making sure that you have things that are open-ended, that the children can experiment with. And if they're using something outside of its um, 
out of its side of its allocated use or they've found a new creative way to use something, let them go. That's a wonderful way to engage their creativity. Um, develop relationships and concepts. Develop independence and autonomy. Make questions um, become prior experiences and new learning. Uh, sorry, make connections between prior experiences and new learnings. So if you knew that they already had some knowledge and they've just learnt something new, um, try and connect the two for them or help them see that. And um, play also allows, uh, allows children to ask questions. So in a program that is child-centred, children are offered the choice of um, what they play, how they play, and who they play with. So giving them um, those options in your program is really important. What they play, how they play, and who they play with. So again, have a bit of a critical um, think about is your program allowing for those three points? Okay, the next thing we're going to have a look at is when and how to plan. So as we saw um, from your responses from the survey questions um, that we asked when you were registering for the session, educators plan along a spectrum. So some plan on the day, um, some in a week in advance, some a fortnight in advance and some a month in advance. So that's quite a broad spectrum for planning. Um, and as we mentioned, there's no regulation or law to say when you have to plan. It's really open-ended and it's up to you as the educator. Um, but with child-centred planning, we would suggest that planning too far out would be really hard. Um, what if the children's needs or interests change? before you get to when you've decided to plan for. And likewise, planning on the day is also hard if you're going to be able to show parents a plan of some sort. So if it's all very haphazard, very spontaneous and um, you know happening in the moment, then you don't really have much to show someone in terms of what you're planning ahead of time. But you don't wanna to go too far ahead of time because by the time you get there, their, their interests and their needs may have changed. They may have developed new schools, uh, skills that no longer need attention, or they may no longer be interested in that thing that you planned for. So weekly or fortnightly plans would allow you to use your knowledge of child's interests um, well. So that may be a good starting point to look at a weekly or a fortnightly plan. Okay, so now we want to know about how to plan. So this session is not going to tell you how to plan. Um, there are lots of different ways that you can do it. So using paper and pen, using beautiful software programs, there's a lot of those available now. Um, planning in your head and writing it down after the event. Each way has its positives and negatives. So what we are looking at is that no matter how you choose to plan um, or how your service requires you to plan, because maybe they've already got a method that they really encourage you to follow, the important thing is, is that your planning be child-centered. So don't get too fixated on how are we doing it, um, but more focused on is this um, supporting the children and is it focused on the children. So making it child-centred. Um, let's have a look at how we're going to make it child-centred. So making, um, how to make sure it's child-centered. So make it responsive to the child's um, current knowledge, their strengths, their ideas, their culture, 
their abilities and their interests. So we really want to focus on those six key points. Um, and if we do that, then we're going to make sure that um, it is child centered. So let's break those things down. You um, have to make your planning responsive to children's current knowledge. So why is this important? It's thought, especially by those um, um, early educational theorists um, like Vygotsky, that children learn best when they learn when their learning adds on to existing learning. So you will sometimes see um, this talked about in discussions about the zone of proximal uh, development, which is the distance between what a child is capable of doing unsupported and what they can do supported from someone um, with more knowledge or expertise than them. So if you have, if you're not quite familiar with that theory um, of proximal development, you can, a zone of proximal development, you can definitely look into that one further. So Vygotsky argued that a child gets involved in a dialogue um, with a peer or an adult and gradually through social interaction and sense making develops the ability to solve problems independently um, and do certain tasks without help. So some educators believe that the role of education is to give children experiences that are within their zone of proximal development but thereby encouraging and advancing their individual learning, such as skills and strategies. So it makes sense that you're trying to give children learning that is based on what they already know. So anything that is close to what they know or what they can do but not too far is more likely to work. So for example, you would not play with a child to learn how to swing between monkey bars if they haven't yet learned how to simply dangle from the bar. So you need to take those steps in order. You need to be aware of, well, what's the child already able to do? And what does the child already know? And then we develop from there. Likewise, you wouldn't plan for a child to cut and paste the collage um, if they haven't first worked out how to use scissors. So that's something else um, that we need to be mindful of. So all of our, um, so that's about being responsive to their current knowledge. Um, all of us have different strengths and things that we do not do so well at. Um, and learning is child, um, learning that is child centered, it's directed at a child's strengths. So we don't want to focus um, yet on um, you know, what they don't do yet or what they can't do yet. That's That shouldn't be our focus. We don't want to be like, okay, well, this child can't yet do this. Let's focus on that. Um, it should be focused on their strengths and taking it from there. So if you have a child, for example, that's really good at using blocks, how can you plan um, that he can use this skill while then learning other skills. So you take their strength and you build on that, you develop on that. And that should really be um, our primary focus. And then we look at making planning responsive to children's ideas. Um, so to do that, children know what they need what they need um, and want to learn. So listen carefully and you can hear them tell you. And then we can use this information that gives you um, to then put in your planning. So some strategies that educators can use to respond to children's ideas include allowing children to choose um, their own play experiences. So provide a variety of different materials, equipment, props, and allow children to decide which ones to explore and using play. So um, you can also mediate to help children um, problem solve while allowing them to negotiate um, and find their own solutions. So you should be there to support them, but also give them some independence. Um, encourage children to solve problems and think um, divergently is important. Let children determine how long they will play. Um, children need unhurried time to play. 
So avoid pushing children to continue with activities that they've lost interest in. Let them move on if they're ready to move on. Um, and then likewise, avoid interrupting them before they have really finished a task or a project or a play experience. Make sure they have ample time to engage in it, enjoy it and see it through. And especially if they're completing, you know, a challenging task, if they've been working on a puzzle um, for a long time and they're close to finishing it, you don't want to deny them that sense of achievement just because, you know, your routine says, well, we've got to pack up right now and go for lunch. You know, make sure that you're being flexible and allowing them um, ample time to play. Um, focus on the process rather than the end product. So encourage children's efforts and avoid comparing children or doing tasks for them. Avoid, um, so for example, they're doing a painting, it's not quite what it was meant to be or what you had preconceived the painting should look like. Um, avoid, you know, interfering and going in there and changing it because to them, that's their artwork um, and that's their interpretation of the task. Avoid um, providing examples of finished products or expecting children to, you know, have the same product. So giving them, I know we tend to steer away from templates now, um, but it can be just as um, hindering to creativity to give show a child, you know, this is what I want you to make and I want all of you to make the exact same thing. Um, make sure that it's open-ended and it's open to their creativity. Um, give children the freedom to be messy, very important. Um, show children that it's okay to be involved in messy play and encourage parents to be aware of messy play too. Um, when I was working in a service, I would often send out a reminder to the families um, just to let them know that mess is good and if they're coming home with dirty clothes and all messy and paint on their elbows and flag in their head and that's a good sign. That's a sign that they've had a really great day and they've had fun. Um, so it might be a good idea to, um, you know, provide some insight and education to the parents as well. Um, let them have ideas about what they want to do. So ask them. Let, them, let them guide that programming and planning from that angle. Okay, we also look at making planning responsive to a child's culture. So the idea of mirrors and windows is useful in, pro in planning. Planning should provide mirrors so that children see themselves and their families um, and their communities reflected in the learning environment, in the materials, the activities, um, the curriculum should also provide windows um, on the world so that the children learn about people. Um, they learn about places, art, science, and so on that they um, would otherwise not really encounter. So you've got a beautiful opportunity as family daycare educators to expose children to new cultures. Um, in diverse and inclusive learning communities, one child's mirror um, is another child's window. So making uh, for wonderful opportunities for collaborative learning. Our culture influences what we learn. Um, remember that children come to a family daycare have already learned things from their home and their friends, um, from their families and their friends in their home environment. So keep that in mind too, that they're coming with you um, and they've already got an established knowledge set. Uh, babies. Babies are making judgments on familiar and unfamiliar people. Toddlers are noticing boys and girls are different. And preschoolers are grouping one another in categories such as hair and skin colour during play-based experiences. So we need to um, think about these things when we plan so that we know what a child already knows and what they don't. Um, and really, again, all these things that we're going through now. Um, so the next one we look at is um, being responsive to a child's ability. All these things should be helping you guide what um, to put in your program or your plan. So in regards to being responsive to children's abilities, knowing what they're capable of, 
um, provide experiences and materials that challenge their various skill levels. Um, and this ensures that children will not become easily bored or frustrated with an experience. Add more complex materials as children become more capable and want to explore their interests further. Um, children need to have courage to learn. If you plan for them to do activities that are beyond their current activities, they can become easily discouraged. Likewise, they won't learn if um, a learning task is repeated when they've already mastered it. So there is a fine balance there. You don't want to do things um, that they're already capable of and you'll probably lose their interest. It's really, they're beyond that now. But you also don't want to challenge them constantly too much because then they won't get that sense of achievement, um, which is really important for their development. If they feel like they're never achieving anything, they're going to give up. So make sure that you are considering their abilities when you are doing programming and planning. And of course, different children will have different levels of ability. Um, so factor that in too. You'll need a diverse range um, of resources and experiences to target those different abilities. And the last one, um, making planning responsive to children's interests. So we all learn more if we um, want to learn and if we're interested in what we're doing. So making sure that that um, is reflected in your program. Use what children are interested in and make sure you know their interests. And the best way to find that out is to observe them, is to sit and watch them, engage with them, listen to them. Um, and from there, you can definitely very quickly um, find out what it is that each child is interested in. And the beautiful part about family daycare is, of course, you have those close connections, um, small groups of children, and you're really bonded with the children and their family. So um, being able to uh, focus on a child's interests, um, you're in a great environment to do that. Okay, so the next thing we're going um, to look at is learning experiences, environments and resources. So what learning experiences should we set up for child-centred learning? Um, what should our environments look like? And what resources do we need? And this is a really commonly asked um, series of questions, um, not just by family daycare educators, by, but by educators in lots of different sectors. Um, so it's an important thing that we look through. So what would child-centered play look like in a family daycare setting? So what would you see children doing in family daycare when an educator was implementing child-centered play? What does it look like? The guide to the National Quality Framework says that you would see children um, initiating and contributing to play experiences that emerge from their own ideas and interests. So you, would, you may be able to hear children requesting things. Um, or saying that they enjoy particular things, or maybe not even saying it, but you can tell that the children are really engaged and they're really enjoying what they're doing. Um, they will go and select something from the room because that's what they've chosen to do. Um, repeating, revisiting and adding to projects or experiences that they have initiated. Developing strong foundations in the culture and language of their family. Um, and in that of the broader community. So without compromising their cultural identities, indicating their deep involvement experiences, in experiences that are rich and meaningful to them through verbal and nonverbal responses and sustained concentration. Um, isn't that a great point that we, I'm sure as educators, you all know that if a child is engaged and enjoying themselves, um, 
and you've got child-centered play going on, they're engaged, they're involved, and for much longer. They're not kind of, you know, flitting around the room, not really sure what they're doing, having a few minutes of this and a few minutes of that. They're really engaging. Um, exploring ideas and theories in play by using their imagination and creativity. Engaging in play during long periods of uninterrupted time. So again, making sure they've got ample time to really get involved because, you know, sometimes the first five, ten minutes, they're still working out maybe what it is that they're doing. Um, for example, if they're using a new construction set, so magnet blocks, they may spend the first five or ten minutes actually working out how these new um, construction materials connect with each other and you know really experimenting and testing and that might be the first five minutes and then it, as they go on they start to realize exactly how um, how much they can create and use with that resource and go from there so really making sure you give them time to get there Okay, so the next thing we're going to look at, um, learning experiences and learning environments. So when planning your learning experiences and your environments, we want to ask questions um, like the following. What are the interests of the children? Um, does this environment enable children to discover, create, and improvise and imagine. Um, so as I'm going through this list of questions, you can maybe be writing notes about what it is you do at your service um, and doing a bit of a critical reflection on, um, on if there's anything you think you could do more. Um, does the environment encourage children to explore and solve problems? What are the children looking for each day and at different times of the day? Um, so what do what do you feel their needs are at different times? So um, after lunch, you may be they may be seeking a more quiet, relaxing um, environment. Um, so keep that in mind. In the morning, they may be full of energy. They want to go outside. Um, are children offered opportunities to play by themselves or as a group? So I like when I see services. Um, they have um, you know, small tables with only one or two chairs set up to allow children to just engage with themselves, as well as your big group areas. Uh, can children choose from a range of materials and equipment? Uh, are children offered a range of experiences so they can choose what interests them? And they might not know yet what their own interests are, but if you've got an array of things on offer, that's how they're going to find out. That's, that's how the children will really find out and how you will also find out what it is they're interested in. But if they've only got one or two options, they may just be you know, making a choice by default. So give them variety and give them the opportunity to choose. Um, are children offered a range of experiences? So in regards to that, think about you have your arts and craft, physical activity, um, so physical play, science, maths and technology, a bit of STEM, um, language and literacy, construction and games, dramatic and imaginative play, uh, music and movement, sensory play, so that could be anything from water, sand, paint, um, and nature environmental experiences. So those are some key different categories there of what you can have on offer to then find out what each child is interested in. And then we need to look at deciding on resources. So as the educator, you decide um, which resources children will have available to play with. Um, provide a variety of interesting materials, um, equipment and props and allow children to decide which ones to explore during play. 
provide experiences and materials that challenge various skill levels. Um, this ensures children will not become easily bored or frustrated with an experience and more complex materials as children become more capable and want to explore their interests further. So when selecting materials and equipment, educators need to consider um, benefits. So what are the benefits for the child? Variety, is there sufficient variety to meet the needs and interests of all children? Safety, are the materials safe for the children who are using them? Um, considering again their skills and abilities. So what might be uh, safe for a five-year-old might not necessarily be safe for a three-year-old, so keeping that in mind. Sufficient quality, uh, quantity, is there enough for all the children to participate freely um, without always having to wait for a turn um, or having to share? So although they're good skills to have, sometimes it is important that things are just accessible to children. Durability, will the materials last? Can they be used extensively by children over a long period of time? So I know we all love Kmart um, and they're definitely good for some things, um, but sometimes we really need to make sure that we're buying quality products that aren't, um, you know, that we're not going to chew through and continually break um, at services so that if, if they are being used um, a lot, especially in um, family daycare, then we need to make sure they're gonna go the distance. Um, accessibility, so can children access materials independently and easily? Uh, independent use, um, so making sure that children can access some things without um, adult assistance. Um, so it's really nice to have, you know, writing and drawing materials available um, so that children can just go and help themselves. Having a child size bookshelf um, is really nice so that children can go and access their own books. Uh, aesthetics, other materials and experiences set up and offered to children in an appealing and interesting way. So if you walked into your family daycare service right now or in the morning, however you have it set up, um, is it enticing? Do, do you feel that a child would walk in and go, wow, what am I going to do? There's some things on the table over there and I can see there's new books on the shelf and there's some fun things outside. Um, or is everything too packed away and they don't really know what to engage with? Or is everything not packed away and it's really messy and, um, you know, there's not that respect or tidy order um, that children respond really well to. So having a think about aesthetics as well. Um, authenticity, so do the materials offer children opportunities to use real tools and equipment, um, which is, um, I'm seeing a lot more of and it's, it's fantastic. Um, cost value, so do the materials provide value for money? Um, consider things like recycled materials, natural materials, things that you can get in your community, um, things that could be donated by families, um, always such a good idea. So I hope that gives you um, some inspiration on deciding on resources. Okay, let's have a look now at um, child-centered planning and programming for different ages. And I've got some great examples on the next um, few slides that we'll have a look at. Um, so sometimes it's easier to make your planning for babies child-centered than other age groups. So you can see what babies are on, um, see where babies are on the cusp of learning. You know what developmental stage they're going through. Um, they're usually quite distinct and clear to see. But that is even more why you should have um, to plan for it. So. The soft rug um, under baby Fatima who is learning to crawl. Um, an educator planned to have this rug there and planned to put um, Fatima on the rug. So that was a very planned experience and this is child-centered planning. Um, so they knew what her abilities were and what she was currently doing. So they planned and they provided for that. So, 
Another example, um, we have preschooler Chang here. So how do you plan in a child-centered way for Chang? So who, she's going to school next year, um, and how do we know what she needs to learn? So you know what Chang, uh, what, what Chang needs to know, um, what she needs to learn before she goes to school. So you program for those things, um, but that doesn't mean that you just work with her. She can be learning what she needs at the same time as baby Fatima. So you might have those very different age groups and those different abilities and still be programming and planning for both. Um, you can program for them to do the same thing sometimes and they can both engage at different levels, whatever ability they're at. For example, if you're using bubbles, um, Chang might learn um, why they stay up in the air, whereas um, baby Fatima might be learning that they break and might have great fun watching them pop. So you need to know um, the children you care for intimately. So know them really well and be able to program for their exact needs and family daycare educators as I mentioned before really excel at this because you have those great relationships with children. And next we'll look at spontaneous things. So what about spontaneous things? I did mention these when we went through um, the content for this evening. Um, can you still do these with all the programming and planning that we're discussing? Um, is this still possible? So the things that happen outside of the planning, they're the spontaneous things. So child-centered planning does not mean that you can never be spontaneous. Um, Pixie, who you may remember from the interview in our last PD in a Pocket, um, wrote a few weeks ago what her group did in her family daycare um, one day. And she said that they made a pom-pom, set up a marble run, took the compost out to the worm farm, raked the leaves in a pile down the side, under the slide, um, sat in the hammock, raked the leaves under the hammock, Rake the leaves into a huge pile and jumped into it. Discovered um, that their feet make squeaky noises when you wiggle um, your bottom from side to side when climbing um, on the climbing dome. Painted on canvases and cards. Used the sewing machine to stitch together parts of the mermaid towel dress that they're making. Um, climbed on the fiddle board. Washed hands together went for a local walk to the playground, collected a bucket of grass for the guinea pigs, um, did the school run, cooked pumpkin soup, cooked fresh banana bread in the bread machine, um, more playing with the pile of leaves, observed some, um, the swallowtail caterpillar living on the lime tree, and right now using scissors, sticky tape and paper um, to do some craft. So out of all those things I listed that happened in the day, obviously not all of those things were planned. But you can fit in what you really want to happen and what happens spontaneously as well. So again, it's all about balance. Um, hopefully not too much um, of the sort of sp spontaneous activity in the image there on the slide. You don't want too much of that. Um, but really finding that nice balance of, okay, yes, I've planned a few things for today, but there's also some spare time because I know that things are just going to come up. Um, a child may ask for something or um, a learning opportunity may arise and we need to be able to follow that. Okay, so now we'll have a look at making planning visible. So remember that you need to make sure your plan is visible. So you can't um, keep everything in your head and never put it down. Um, others have to be able to see how you're planning. Um, and as we mentioned before, a parent um, can, a parent or family can ask at any time to see the plan, plan and program and how their child is engaged in that. 
So how did what you do respond to child, children's strengths, interests and culture? You need to be able to show that somewhere as well. And remember, we link this back to compliance. Um, you need to draw the link so that your that families, your service and authorised officers are very important at the time of assessment and rating. Um, can see that what you do uh, is child centred. So really important um, that you're meeting those requirements. Okay, so that does bring us to the end of our presentation section for this evening. Um, we are now going to move on to the video. Um, the person, um, Alger, um, our video is with um, Tash Trevetan, sorry I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, from Inspired EC and she's being interviewed um, as always by the lovely Lisa Bryant. Um, Inspired EC does a lot of things but they also run um, a family daycare service. So the video runs for about um, half an hour, just under half an hour, and then we're going to have um, plenty of time for questions. So you may have been noting down some questions as we went through, and we'll go through um, the question box or the chat box there and take note of those. But as you're watching the video, you're very welcome to also add in some um, questions too, and we will come back together after the video and have a look at those. So I'm really excited to have here tonight um, Tash from Inspired EC. Welcome to uh, PD you. in a Pocket. Thank <laughs> you so much. I'm really excited. <laughs> Good. Um, listen, um, can you just give us a brief overview of, you know, how you got involved in family daycare and what your role is now? Okay, so um, family daycare, I've been a trainer and consultant for about 14 years now in early childhood, and we were speaking at a New South Wales family daycare conference around nature play and the benefits of getting outside your gate and being in natural environments with children. Um, some of the educators from that area came up to us afterwards and said, oh, our scheme won't let us, like they're a bit scared or worried about you know the, the regulations and things, and we talked to them about how it's actually allowed and um, supported with our framework, and um, and people were saying, oh, please start a scheme. So we did. <laughs> um, the idea was to actually start it to be something like a bit of a model scheme that would help other, other schemes understand and see that it, it could happen and that um, what it looked like in action and to not be so scared of it. Um, I understand if you're not as comfortable as we are with that sort of stuff, it could have been scary, but um, basically it was just to show people that it can happen and also to really um, advocate and raise the I guess the perception of family daycare, especially in the early childhood settings, like family daycare is one of my favourite things. My, my sons went through family daycare. It's a beautiful um, option for um, ed early education and care. So that's... Um, we think so too. Yeah, it's amazing. It's like, I love family daycare. Um, and also, um, so I'm the approved provider. Oh, one of the approved providers, Nicole Holton is the other one also. Um, but I've been in every role except for the educator, I guess. So when we started, I was the person that went out and did all the registration visits. I was the first coordinator for our scheme. Um, I helped bring on other people within our team gradually. So I've done all the visits. I've done helped develop all the policies. I've helped develop all the processes. And I mean, the team have gone above and beyond that now since I've sort of stepped back a bit from it, but I'm still really involved even from an approved provider perspective. Um, so okay, yeah, that's, yeah. that's great. So let's um, look at the topic that we're talking about today, which is child-centred programming and planning. Why yeah. do you think that's important? Oh, because it's about them and it's not adult adult um driven i i feel like you know children have got such a small window of time they need to be around people that really um are providing opportunities for them that are child led and come from that child's intrinsic motivation like um it's so important that we because each child's so different and they're at all different ages and stages and if we're not um following on and taking our lead from that, then we're sort of not providing the best opportunities we can for children. Um, and if programs come from an adult agenda um, too much, I mean, there's nothing wrong with provocations and say maybe in, in intentions, but 
Um, I'm a big, I'm really passionate about yes spaces. So um, every time something is adult led and goes against the child's perspective or the, the way the ch child's leading um, their program, then we can tend to sort of um, push against those intrinsic motivations or those fascinations that they have, which isn't great for a child's sense of well-being, to be honest. And when we know well-being and involvement from Farrell Avis's work is, you know, they're the two best indicators of high quality early education and care. So if children have got high sense of well-being, deep levels of involvement, we know we've got it right. So just for those that might not understand what the difference is, what would you see as adult-led um, programming and planning? So adult lens probably, there's all variances. I think there's like a spectrum of it. So there can be as extreme as on week two of term three on, on the Wednesday, we're going to do the colour blue, <laughs> you know, like it can be that extreme and I've seen settings where it is like that, not family daycare as such, but across the, I mean, obviously consult across all different um, areas in early childhood, but um, I mean, that's the most extreme, but even down to um, just something recently, it was in a in an infant's room and one of the children had noticed a truck out the window and straight away that that on the program the educator sort of felt that they needed to then do an interest area on trucks and even that in itself is a form of adult led because they're not look i mean a baby isn't going to be thinking about what they're going to do with like the stage of play of a baby didn't match up if you know what i mean so um it can be it can be intent, intended and it can be accidental as well. I think it, it very varies um, on the understanding of play development of the educator um, as well as, you know, um, um, or the understanding of where child led is from as well. But it's that really structured stuff that, that adults can give. But I think a lot of it is to, as long as it's an offering, not a you must do this or it's the only option, um, that can be a factor in that as well. You, like I said before, it's great to offer a provocation, but it's still, if that's the only option or if that's the, the whole group time and everyone's got to come, then that's still not really child-led. So, so you're much more in favour of, you know, um, a much more child-centred approach. Oh, so, definitely. Um, you wouldn't be using themes or would you be using themes? <laughs> It depends on the age of the child and what the theme is, you know. So for me, um, the theme I would use if I was going to use a theme for infants would be discovery play. So it would be highly sensorial treasure baskets, but that lends itself to the stage of play of that age group. But for um, a preschool age group, you know, if I identified the children had shown a really strong interest in something and you sort of presented um a provocation or an interest table or something that's based around the observations that you've seen or the conversations you've had with children or just your knowledge of that child, then you might set that some that up. But I think it also has to be balanced out in your space so it's not the only option that's there as well. So it's definitely how you set up the information, um, the invitation to play or even how um, you present it. So sometimes like for group times are a little bit contentious with me. <laughs> um, I, I, even for a group time, I feel that they should all be offerings to children, not a everyone must come and do them because it's, um, but I'm not sure if that if, how far down that path you want to go. But yeah. I think um, you'd find that in a lot of family daycare services, people would, educators would be expecting all, the, you know, the four children they care for, to be doing the same thing at the same time. Are you saying that isn't necessary? Yeah, I don't think so. I think um, I think it's really tricky to do a group time that meets multiple children's um, intrinsic motivations. So especially when you're in family daycare, generally your children are multi-aged too, so they're at different stages of play. Um, they might be want to be involved in, at different levels too, so that some of them might be in, interested in it for like five to ten minutes some might be for like 10 seconds <laughs> and sometimes it can be challenging to manage all that at the same time and we tend to sometimes not all the time um be trying to manage the children that aren't as engaged with the children that are so you're telling you know johnny down here i can sit still and listen to the book whereas you know alice over here's really into the book and getting really annoyed with all the interruptions as well so if johnny's got something else in the room that he actually likes to play with and can you know, naturally leave the group and just play there and still be engaged and with obviously within supervision, 
everyone's getting something out of it. Alice gets sure. to listen to the story and be engaged, but Johnny still gets to be involved in something that's intrinsically motivating to him. So, Okay, so let's imagine you go into one of your best educators' um, homes, right? I don't want you to name who they are or anything, but what would you expect to see happening in their home? So I would expect... Again, and this is really important with family daycare, you're not mini childcare centres and you don't need to be. So you, I would expect it to feel home-like. I would expect to see that family reflected in the space as well. Um, I would expect to see a lot of loose parts and open-ended play spaces that children can make their own and to um, to create, into, to be able to use in a way that's meaningful for them when that intrinsic motivation or fascination comes to them. I'd want natural elements or act, um, for me, indoor, outdoor or natural access is really important, you know, natural outdoor spaces. Um, but I'd want it to be reflective of what the children are exploring. I'd want it to be messy because we know that's what it's going to be like. One person with four children trying to keep everything spotless, that's not going to happen. I still remember a story of actually going into um, one of our educa educators right at the beginning, an educator's space, and it was spotless. And I was like, what's got? It actually freaked me out a little because I was like, this is not what does she look like? Where's the play? You know, where's the play? Um, unless they're all... Asleep, she uh, cleaned it all up because you were coming, eh? Yeah, actually, she ended up not actually staying with us for that long because it, we weren't balancing on our um, philosoph philosophical um, perspective. So you've got to be able to see play. Play needs to be evident, you know. Yeah, sure. yeah. If you're in a space and children are there, like if it's not the beginning of the day... Before, you've, before they've even arrived, you'd expect it to be messy. So so how does play fit into, you know, um, child-based planning and programming? Well, it's everything. It's everything. Um, child-based child programming is play because that's how children explore the world. So it should be watching their play, understanding their play, and then offering opportunities to facilitate that play. Um, I think as adults, and especially in early childhood, in um, in particular, especially maybe, you know, 15, 20 years ago, we were really, really um, encouraged to engage, engage, engage in children's play, you know, what are their voices, ask them questions, all that sort of thing. And as the research and the development stuff that I've been, that I've researched and even in my own practice, the less we're actually involved in play or the more we actually wait for the cue from the children's play to be involved, the better facilitators of play we are. So to be able to sit back and, I mean, it's a really fine-tuned skill as an educator to be able to gauge a child's play cycle and know when to come in and when to not. Because then when you see that really deep level learning happening, and that doesn't happen when you're getting quizzed seven million times, a child, you know, the child's not going to stay in that trough of deep level learning if they're being asked what colour is that and how many trains have you got every five minutes so um you know if the adult can really watch the play and be responsive to the play and sensitive to the play they'll be able to use that then to guide the program to know what resources to provide what time and space to provide i mean time and space are what two of our really important resources that we can give or yeah provide for children oh tell me more about them oh yes yeah, so spaces in particular like i'm you know, I, I love provocate, depending on the age of the child, but, you know, some interest areas and provocations for play. But you've also got to have that wild, loose parts area too that can be anything. If, if you go in, if a child goes into space, I always talk about the story. I don't know if you ever watched Banana Man. It was on ABC. Anyway, Eric was this boy who used to eat a banana and turn into a banana man. He always wanted a banana rocket. So, and I always think if I walked into one of these settings and I turned around and went, okay, that's cooking over there and I've got a drawer there and I can only build blocks there and the blocks have got all this, all the cars and stuff there, so it's transport. Where can I make my banana, banana rocket today? So it's, we call them deconstructed play spaces. So it's great to have something like that, which can, is usually full of loose parts, which can be anything. There's no provocation as such. It's just materials. But also from a time perspective, um, it's having large blocks of uninterrupted time. So what, what, you know, in a great um, loose parts kind of setup, what would you expect to see? You know, do we need millions of little bits of things or are we looking at big loose parts or are we yeah. looking at? Well, a variety depends on your space, doesn't it? So it's um, what your capacity can hold. Also, you don't want to go over the top with loose parts to start with. You want some smaller manipulative pieces. You want fabrics. You want connectors like um string or rope and 
you want a variety of things and then you can observe that play and build on it. But then outdoors, obviously, you want larger bits and pieces as well as smaller bits and pieces that you can utilise together. Also allowing children to move parts from one context to the other is really empowering as well. So What, take the inside toys outside? I know, it's shock horror. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and that's, again, where I um, encourage services and, and educators to not get not spend too much money on the resources that you have unless it's really specific and really intentional for, for for something in particular like because if you get that precious about the materials that you're and resources that you're giving children especially the younger ones um at like your infants and toddlers they're gonna you know what they're gonna do and they're in those first two stages of play of what is this object and what can I do with it which means we're throwing it we're banging it we're hiding it we're transporting it we're chewing it we're doing all that sort of stuff so <laughs> think about the resources you're providing and don't make them so precious that children can't use them in a way that's meaningful for them okay um as we know, educators have to document their program and um, yes. you know, share it with parents. Mm -hmm. How can this be done for a child-centred program? Yeah. How can it be done easily? Okay, so I don't know if you're aware, I don't know if we discussed this, Lisa, but I'm actually a trainer for Claire One for Talking Thinking Floor Books and they're my favourite documentation process because they are simple, they're meaningful, they're not a box to fill. So you can do half a page one day, you might do four pages the next day. It's all child-centred. It's all about what's happening in the space. Um, and it's really, it's a really good, not too confrontational form of documentation, especially for families. So it's a good way then to advocate for the learning that's happening through that play-based learning in a, in a way that's, like I said, sometimes documentation can be overwhelming for families if it gets really, you know, I think there's documentation for Sometimes, I'd say like always. <laughs> Yeah, so I, documentation needs to be authentic and needs to be meaningful and quality rather than quantity. You know? Okay, but let's let's break down, um, you know, the words documentation and programming because yes. I know some educators think of those two things as two separate things. So yes. let's let's just looking at, you know, preparing your program for the week. Yeah. or, you know, whatever, how do you do that if you're going to be child-centred? Yeah, so, again, it depends on the age group of the children that you're working with, but really it should be just looking at what the children are doing and turning that into your planning. You know, um, you see what the children are in, interested in, think about where it's coming from and how it could be, where it could go. Um, the article that I sent to you, before, the other uh, was it this morning or yesterday, um, about teacher Tommy, so he sees his role as being ready, ready for play. So it's like, how can I be ready for where this could go? And I love that idea because it's all still, as a teacher, I'm thinking, I'm planning, I'm reflecting, where can it be? I'm planning for that and then I'm ready if it eventuates or how. But I'm still going to have to write it down or type it into a program, aren't I? <laughs> Oh, you can, but remembering a planning cycle and a program is just that what do you see, think about that and have some thoughts around that, plan for it, and then how does it eventuate and play out in your space? That's a very nice explanation <laughs> of the planning cycle. <laughs> okay, I, th I suspect that um, some of our family daycare educators are used to a much more rigid form of um, programming and that you might be scaring them a bit with this kind of like, <laughs> yeah, but uh, let's, <laughs> leave, yeah, let's leave it there for now. Um, uh, so in my mind, one of the best things about family daycare is that educators know their children. They have absolute intimate knowledge of their children how can they use that in child-centered programming well the thing the thing is you cannot really effectively plan for a child or program for a child until you really get to know them so that's why family daycare is the best environment for that i'll probably get in trouble if anyone else see read watches this but <laughs> i uh, when i do Don't worry the rest of the sector isn't that important <laughs> oh, i know <laughs> Um, so I, you know, even when I work with services, when a child first comes with you, don't feel the pressure to be documenting and planning straight up. Use your program 
and your documentation should be around your relationship and building that relationship. Your program is relationships initially because otherwise you're just chasing your tail. The longer, the more in-depth your relationship is and the more you know the child in your space, the more effectively you're going to be able to guess what their intrinsic motivations are because that's all our observation and planning processes are is just us guessing what's going on in that child's head and what they might need. But we're, it's all guesses. So the more we, if we focus on the relationship building and getting to know those children first, we're more likely to be able to guess what might be happening for that child and then be better placed to actually provide the right resources or the opportunities that they might need to continue that child-led program. You've used the phrase intrinsic motivation a few times. Can you explain that for those, you know, yeah. that, um, yeah, maybe yeah. we know a lot of our families here, having a, a lot of our educators that watch this series have English as the second language. We come from all over the world, <laughs> which yeah. is great. That's amazing. But sometimes yeah. we need to, to break down, you know, educate, uh, early education care jargon for people just because sometimes people won't kind of say, I'm not really sure what that means. So yeah, and I get to be the one that says, what's intrinsic? Yes. <laughs> That's great. And, like, another term, like Claire Warden uses the term fascinational, and it's the same thing. Like, it's when the child, and it's really simple, the child's body is saying, I need to explore this, do this, or whatever right now. It could be from a sensory integration perspective. It could be just their body's physical development in whatever level, saying, do this now. Like, um, or it could be the brain going, I need to know more about this right now. So a lot of in the age group we work with, a lot of the play and the things that they're doing isn't really conscious in 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 a sense like um if you know much about schema, schema play schema play is child's urges like it's their brain is saying i need to know more about this concept right now and it could be for example trajectory so and it's so a child's like child's brain's going you need to know how things move through the air and you're going to do it with everything and everyone around you so they just their brain is going you do this not the child going oh i might go over pick up that block and throw it across the room so it hits down in the head that's so those those things they're urges they're these fascinations that the child is just um intrinsic motivations that the child is just drawn to do and and their body's saying you need to do this explore this feel this or their brain's going you need to build this knowledge or you need to explore this concept so it's these urges from either the brain or the body that are uh, urging that child to be involved in that um, I remember that's... when my daughter was really little, whenever she was on the verge of learning a new skill, like pulling up or walking or sitting, etc., she didn't sleep for 24 hours beforehand <laughs> because all she wanted to do was yeah. that thing. And yeah. then she'd master it and she'd go, oh, great, now go to sleep. <laughs> Yeah, and, it's, and it makes for such a nicer environment because if you're le- if you're following the child's lead and the child's lead from these urges or fascinations or intrinsic motivations, whatever you want to call it, if you're following that, you're again creating yes spaces, which obviously then leads to less behaviour support problems. And, you know, if you're following the child's lead, there's going to be less pushback. Yeah, except at 3am in the morning when they <laughs> want to back to the city. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not into that one. <laughs> Okay, talking about babies, yeah, how do we plan for babies in a child-centred way? (gasps) Because I I get this with, you know, I'm really clear about what you're talking about with toddlers, et cetera, but babies, it's kind of, you know, like surely we've got to give them paths to learn all the stuff that they need to learn. (laughs) It's funny. being provocative. I know you are. (laughs) It's funny, babies are born with everything they need, you know, like they're, they're intrinsic, oh, they're, well, they're natural explorers of the world. I'll stop using intrinsic motivation. Um, know that with babies, you care is the program. All those care moments are the program, those relations, anything that helps develop relationships and attachment and help build um, and have, have help that child feel loved and accepted and appreciated, that is what is the program for babies. Pro- programs are all, that child needs to feel love and safe. Because we know if a child doesn't feel that way, their brain's not going to develop in the way it needs to, and they're not going to make, they're not going to deeply involved in play if they're feeling stressed or they're overly upset. So it is all about care environments that are um, highly sense, not too sensorial, but sensorial in the right way. Um, what do you mean by sensorial? Sensorial, so like engaging all the senses, which is um, well, we've actually got seven senses. 
we've got our five senses plus proprioception and vestibular. So if anyone wants to know more about that, Balanced in Barefoot by Angela Hanscom is the best book in the world and a really good read even for families. However, so it's, it's already, you know, sight, sound, taste, touch, smell, um, making sure that it is like that um, is sensorial for the baby to explore that way. But really when it all comes down to it, if you had to focus on one thing in your program for babies, it's you utilising as many of the opportunities to really connect, show that child that they're loved, uh, make that child feel safe, secure, um, and then the rest will flow, especially in the family daycare because we've got multi-ages and you've got all these other people helping you with the baby as well. So, um, yeah, the priority... And often <laughs> loving that baby as much as you do. Yes, <laughs> yes. But, yeah, your pro the pro baby program is attachment and care and love and security. And we can use those care, daily care moments to do that as well, like nappy changes and meal times, really making the most of those opportunities when they are one-on-one. -on -one. But surely you've got a program for them in some way. You can't just say, you know, when the assessment rating officer comes out over authorised officer or whatever they're called these days, <laughs> you can't just say, you know, oh, I love the babies. Yeah, you can put up um, a diagram of Maslow's hierarchy and put that on there and say that is my program <laughs> because Maslow's, Maslow's hierarchy shows that if we don't have those first two levels of that pyramid solid um they're never going to reach their full potential and that's sure. so you can use that there's lots of other um baby theorists that we can use as well but Maslow's hierarchy is the most solid obvious clear one that just shows exactly what it's all about it's underpinned by research and that is our program. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think we've almost come to the end of our time, but is there anything else that you want to say to educators about child-centred program? Any way you can encourage them to move towards trying it? Give it a go. Make it simple. The th best thing is utilise loose parts. Loose parts are one of the best ways to really support child-centred um, environments because the open-ended materials that all the children in your space can use in different ways. So your environment can be one of those um, ways that you can really support a child-led program. If you can set that up with, um, with good loose part spaces, it will make it easier for you and you'll also be able to step back and watch multiple play happening in that space and then gather information. And post-its are great. Post-its are one of the best things that we can have because you can jot ideas down on there um, to follow up later on. But just pair it back and know that play, uh, well-being and involvement are the, are the best things that we could be focusing on rather than all the other stuff. And, you know, I reckon they're kind of pretty much the things that Family Day Kid does well anyway. Oh, yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much for coming no to worries. us today, Tash. That was really great. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, some great questions coming through. Thank you, everyone, um, for putting them in. So someone's just asked about um, if, obviously, we, we spoke a lot about tonight needing to share the program um, with... Oh, have I lost you? No, I've got you. Um, having to share the program with parents. Um, somebody said at the moment parents are being greeted at the door. Um, so they um, often um, don't get the opportunity or the chance um, to share that. So what are some other ways? So you can definitely share it digitally is um, a great option. Um, whether you share notes through email um, or you have um, other methods, you might send out, because we spoke about having a weekly or fortnightly program, you could be sending out a document to them on a regular basis because um, it doesn't need to be a verbal exchange. It can definitely be and it should be an actual document um, that you're sharing with your family. So I hope that that helps with that. Um, another question that's come through is where can I source my activities in the program um, to continue the planning cycle? Um, so that's a great question. Um, and 
especially going back to the theme of tonight being child-centered, the majority of your, observa uh, your program and planning should be coming from your observations of the children themselves. So you should be observing them on a regular basis, um, looking at what they do, and then um, planning and programming from there. So you'll have lots of different um, abilities. You may have a variety of ages, but really looking into what the children are capable of, what they're interested in, and putting that as at the forefront of your program and plan. You then also have um, elements that are um, educator led, so you'll have things that you're scaffolding or planning, um, intentional teaching um, that you plan out for them that are not necessarily based on their needs or interests, but it's something that you feel that they ought to know um, or that you're interested in teaching them that you feel would benefit them. Um, and whether that's to do with something to do with their milestones or something that you want to introduce them to in the community to teach them about. Maybe it's one of your interests that you want to share with them. Um, so that could be another source of um, activity for your program and plan. Uh, another great question. How do you know how much to put out so that there's enough for children to enjoy, but not too much where children become overwhelmed? Um, of what to choose from and clutter. So yeah, great question. And it is a bit of a, a magic question. Um, and I guess you could stop by, you could start by looking around and feeling, having a look and thinking, do I feel that this space is overwhelming? Um, or, you know, really, listening and watching to how the children are engaged. Usually if they are overwhelmed or if it is cluttered and there's too much, you might see an increase in accidents um, because children are tripping over things, falling over. Um, you may see, you know, really erratic, um, active behavior. They're just, you know, they can't come down. That's another reason um, or another sign that it might be overwhelming. Um, so it is hard, but you just have to kind of gauge it. Start by looking around. I go with um, neat and tidy and orderly, um, but also that there's things set out and um, that children can view and see. Um, and another thing, just going back to that point, because someone else has asked how much um, do we put, how much do we put out? Um, what's the right amount of resources to put out? Um, you don't want to have too few that you're constantly causing an environment for conflict where children are, you know, arguing and fighting over things. Um, but you do want to also provide opportunity for sharing and turn taking. Okay. So another good question that's come through, do I have to explain in my program every day um, what we did? So as we mentioned, there is no regulation of how to program or what to program. We know that we need to have it visible. Um, and I guess being, being mindful of the children in your care, which days are they coming? And if you did skip um, documenting or planning for particular days are those children only are there children that only come on those days so you need to make sure that every child is covered in your program and your plan and you keep in mind too that families again parents are allowed to ask you at any time how you are programming and planning for their child so if you don't have things documented every day that's where it can become difficult so no, there's nothing to say that you have to, um, but it is a good idea to show that you do have some kind of a plan each day. You have an idea of what you're doing, um, but then going back and documenting exactly what you did. Um, no, there's nothing to say you have to, but just think about what the repercussions are if you don't have anything documented would be my advice.
Okay, another great question. Um, where do we document critical reflection? Is it somewhere that parents can view it or is it a more personal document? Now, this is a fantastic question. Um, critical reflection is definitely something that a lot of educators do choose to keep to themselves because um, the best critical reflection is when it's very honest. And sometimes when we're very honest about our practice or about how our day went or about things that we want to change about our service or things about the children or things that we're noticing, um, it's sometimes not always positive. So that's where you need to think, okay, is this just critical reflection for me to see? Or is this something, is there something that I've really... Um, come to a realization of um, that would be great for the parents to see too. So something that you've, maybe you've made a great improvement in the way you do certain things, um, then that would be something that would be great to share with the parents. And in regards to where to do it, I do like the idea of having it on the same documentation. A lot of people will have these um, program templates where you know you're planning out what you're doing for the week and then you do have a bit of an area for critical reflection um, on the side and I do like that idea because you can easily link it back okay this is everything we did and this is what our week looked like and this is how I reflected on that week so it is nice to go hand in hand or even if it's in a folder and you've got you know your planning and your program and then straight after that is your critical reflection on what happened. Um, but really there's so many ways you can do it. Um, but I do think it is nice if you can see that link between what it is that you are actually critically reflecting on. Um, so I hope that that answers some of your question. Okay, another question, how do you program for babies and toddlers um, in the same week, fortnight, month? Um, so we did have a look at that with those two examples of the two children at different age groups. So we had the baby and the preschooler. And really um, a good example was you can provide the same experiences or the same activity, but because of their different developmental level or their different needs or their different interests, they have different interpretations of that activity and they're gonna be learning different things. So um, preschoolers may be learning something far more complex whereas babies or toddlers are just kind of discovering what that is. Um, so certainly you can plan. And what you could do is if you do have a um, printed out or typed out plan, you can certainly um, identify the age groups within that. So you're saying, okay, for the for the baby um, or the babies, I've planned this based on their needs and their interests and their abilities. And for my preschooler, I've planned this. Um, and that's what they're going to do. And you can break them up into age appropriate activities. Or if you're gonna do the one activity, for example, you might do parachute play outside, you're gonna know that the preschooler is going to be learning one set of skills or developing on certain strengths um, and babies may be being exposed to something for the first time. But they're both doing the same activity and they're both engaging in it. Um, so yeah, that's something else to have a think about. Um, another good question, in the program, do we have to put one child each month for individual observations or all the children each month? So um, my understanding is um, that you need to be able to show that you are programming and planning for every child in your care. Now, what that looks like um, is different in all different um in different services. Um, but I would be saying, um, you know, a lot of uh, services say we do one, one um, observation per month per child. But you really need to think, you know, is that reflective of high quality engagement with the children? In family daycare, um, I think you can um, do a lot more 
observation and documentation per child um, because you are um, you do have those great relationships with them and you're very in tune with what their needs and their development are. You can observe very easily when they are achieving new skills. Um, so I don't believe there's any regulation around quantity as such, um, but just making sure that you are showing that you um, have planned for each child and that you can assess their development and you're tracking that along the way. Okay, so I'll just see if there's any more questions before we finish up. Um, another one, how can we include um, My Time Our Place or EYLF, so the learning framework specifically in the program? So I guess if you have planned a particular activity, um, you could just see which um, of the uh, learning outcomes that it best relates to and just simply linking it into your program. Um, so this is a planned activity and you may it may be for the group or it may be it may be for all the children in, in your care or it may be for a specific child and then you could simply put a link um, which is the most appropriate so what it most um, closely relates to within the learning framework that you're using and you may find that after you've done the activity it may be interpreted very differently by the children or it may not have gone as you planned it may have turned into a very different learning experience and then in your observation, you may tweak it and say, well, the aim was to, um, you know, achieve these outcomes, but we actually achieve these outcomes. So, you know, you can have flexibility there. Um, critical reflection, so a question around critical reflection. Um, how detailed does it need to be and what information do you put in there? Um, so again, really up to um, you how detailed it is and what you're really in very simplistic terms, critical reflection is all about um, how did how did the week go? Um, what worked well? What would I change? Um, what are some things that I've learned about myself or the children or my practice? Um, anything that you um, are reflecting on that may change future practice um, or may enlighten you in some way to realizing things that you're doing or change the way you things that you're doing. So sometimes it can be very simple and other times it can be really complex. So for example, um, some critical, some very simple critical reflection would be um, finding that the children are really um, off with their behavior at, at lunchtime, um, finding that it's impacting all the children, um, staff are becoming very stressed or in family daycare, you the educator are becoming very stressed and you may tweak your routine slightly to bring lunch forward and then you find that um, because the, the children are having lunch earlier um, you're seeing less behavioral issues in the group that's a very simple example or it may be something that you reflected on as an educator um, that you went you know, you did some networking and you spoke to some other educators and you learned some things and you're going to try and bring those back into your service. So, again, not a lot of regulation or, um, you know, scripted how much you have to do. Um, it, it can vary greatly. Okay. So I think that might be all for our questions.
Yeah, so someone's also commenting, you know, why can't there just be a simple template for programming um, so that we would all be right on track and know exactly what we're doing. Um, and that is a really good point. And, you know, you can definitely get templates and softwares that guide you in programming and planning. Um, but I guess the, re the, the main reason they do leave it so open-ended um, is because they're respecting the fact that we are all very individual as educators and we are individuals. We have very different ways of doing things and it's giving us um, although it can see, seem a burden sometimes because now we've got so much choice in program and planning um, it's really giving that up opportunity to let ourselves shine and um, as a professional as an educator and discovering different ways that we do things and also remember there's no there's no shame in doing some trial and error you could try one particular programming or planning format and see if that works for you and if it doesn't file it away show that it's you know part of it was part of your journey as an educator that you're learning and you try something else whether it's okay fortnightly was too complicated let's try weekly or that particular format wasn't being received well by parents they were getting really confused let's try a different format so whatever it is trial and error um, but just see it as an opportunity to express yourself and go with what works for you Okay, so I think that's all the questions um, for this evening. Um, again, really um, sorry about the issues with the video, but we're going to get that up on the website um, as soon as possible. And that way you'll be able to watch a really clear recording of that. Um, okay, where are we? Um, so that does bring us to the end of the session. So please remember that you can participate in the Facebook group. Um, again, if you haven't already, we would love to. That's a great opportunity um, if anyone is willing to share um, their methods of their programming um, or a plan that they may have that they'd like to share. Um, and we can all network and see different ways of doing things. So that would be a great place to do that. Um, all you need to do is type in PD in your pocket into Facebook and that will come up. So again, thank you everyone so much for participating in this session. Um, we hope you've gained a lot and you've learned some great things. Um, and now you can go ahead and get on with pro programming and planning um, and making sure that it's child centered. Thanks everybody and have a great night. <laughs>